So it says the webinar is now live on the top of all your screens as well. Okay. Correct. And I am recording it. Perfect. Um, where will the recordings be posted after the conference? I think I missed um, it. I know they're recorded to a cloud, but I'm not sure. I think that um, you will have access to that, but I'm not sure where that's located at. We weren't given that information, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Is there a way to see uh, attendance or who's here? Or if people are here? Click on participants. Ah, got it. Thank you. Eugenia's here. Okay. People are starting to filter. Feels like right before a virtual class, just watching people kind of filtering in, like with two minutes to go before it starts. I see uh, Tom Head in the attendees, one of my undergraduate professors. Tom, great to have you here. All right, well, it's on the hour. I'm gonna avoid using times just because uh, we're all in different time zones, I'm sure. Um, so we'll go get ahead and get started. I'm sure people will filter in as we continue. Um, we have, well, so it's a welcome to our panel on issues in institutional theory. Uh, we get to be the guinea pigs for the first panel this morning. Um, we have five presentations today. Unfortunately, Claudius could not make it. So each presenter will have 18 minutes to present. Um, and we will take questions at the end. Uh, that said, if you look at the bottom, there should be an option for a Q&A and a chat. 
Um, if you want to post questions in either the question and answer tab or the chat, I'll keep track of them. And at the end, we'll go through them in order of when they come in. Um, so don't feel the need to hold your questions all the way to the end. We just won't answer them until the end. Um, so without further ado, let's get started with our institutions more important than innovation presented by Novica Supic. Thank I hope you. I pronounced your last name correctly. Yes, it is. It's okay. Um, uh, well, um, uh, first, um, motivation for um, our research. Uh, the aim, just a minute. Um, first motivation for our research, uh, the aim of this paper is to shed more light uh, on the effects of technological innovation on economic progress from the institutional's perspective. Uh, based on historical data on economic growth and technological changes in the United States, we question the assumption of mainstream economics that innovation performed by uh, profit-making enterprises is a key source of productivity growth and argue that economic progress is primarily determined by institutional structure and progressive institutional changes. Uh, our paper as well as presentation is organized into five sections. In this slide, we can see as its usual introduction, literature review, uh, conceptual framework and status facts. Then we focus on innovation and institutional failure. And finally, conclusion. Uh, during uh, the golden age of capitalism, from the late 1940s to the mid 1970s, the US economy recorded rapid economic growth, low of unemployment and income inequality, even in the absence of substantial commercial innovations. In the period since then, a huge investment in innovation and new technologies have not yielded to the gains to economic progress comparable to the golden age. In our research, we examine the factors that may explain this difference that go beyond neoclassical economics. Uh, we argue that the shift in R&D activities from public to private sector and accordingly amassing of corporate power limit the power of society to improve the welfare by using the innovation in collaborative and cumulative uh, way. Uh, what makes uh, the institutionalist conception of economic progress different from the mainstream economics is the assumption that the effects of economic growth on income distribution are, are not a natural or automatic outcome of uh, market forces. Institutional arrangements and uh, power relationship have a strong impact on the rate and distribution of economic growth among social classes. Uh, such approaches to economic progress stems from the difference between institutionalism and neoclassical economics in constructing their models. Uh, namely, institutionalists try to explain human behavior by placing it in its institutional context and test their models by comparing hypothesized institutional structure with observations. In institutionalism, technological progress is seen as a driver of uh, economic and social progress, while institutions are often seen as a negative force that prevent adoption uh, to new ways of doing things. Uh, considering the role of technology in economic progress, uh, Clarence Ayers defined as one of the basic principles of economic progress, the principle according to which technological progress spreads in inverse proportion to institutional resistance. To Atkinson and Steiner, technological progress can and will drive economic progress if institutional conditions allow it. Uh, the problem in uh, developing institutions advantageous to technological progress lies in the need to reconcile two conflicting objectives associated with patent protection. On the one hand, property right is essential to innovator to protect its invention from free riding. But on the other hand, patent protection is not in the line with the collaborative and cumulative nature of innovation process. Using patent law to correct one market failure creates another market failure in the terms of monopoly power over innovations. From a Weblian perspective, uh, the use of uh, patent protection by large corporation could be considered as a predatory strategy, uh, given that innovation has become encapsulated by powerful interests who are more interested in profits than improving standard of living. In this way, Cecilia Rickup uh, argued that uh, monopolizing innovation is at the core of contemporary capitalism. As a result, the common man 
may not be benefiting from economic gains associated with new products and uh, technologies. Uh, our articles contributes to the to the institutional literature on innovation and economic progress by providing empirical evidence and theoretical arguments that the difference in economic progress during the Keynesian and neoliberal era can be associated with the shift in RD activities from public to private sector and accordingly concentration of innovation in the hands of corporate capital. Uh, from the institutionalist perspective, economic growth is uh, primarily a consequence of technological uh, change, while income distribution is mainly determined by institutional arrangements. Innovations as progressive technological changes create the possibility to make transition from society of scarcity to the society of abundance, a society in which extremes of inequality are not necessary and in which the standard of living is constantly improving. Uh, given incredible productivity imminent to modern innovation, high and rising income inequality and their economic and social consequences are not inevitable. Consequently, income inequality and poverty occurs not because of resource constraints or a lack of technological knowledge, but because institutional arrangements have not been adjusted to a productive potential of the modern society. Accepting this framework, it is possible to relate economic progress with progressive technological changes that are accompanied by progressive institutional changes. According to Bush, Bush the concept of progressive institutional changes refers to the placement of ceremonial patterns of behavior by instrumental patterns of behavior in communities' problem-solving processes. If institutions are ceremonial dominant, a technological innovation will be absorbed and permitted only to the extent that such changes are compatible with powerful vested interests uh, that depend on ceremonial patterns of behavior. As a result, economic progress can be encapsulated by the powerful vested interest and therefore do not contribute to social welfare in accordance with its potential. To what extent these ideas are compatible with standard facts from the US economy. Uh, given that economic progress is a long-term process, the time framework of our analysis spans the period from 1953 uh, to, uh, to 2019. Uh, the period is divided into three e eras, the Keynesian era, the 1970 crisis, and the neoliberal era. Each era reflects different macroeconomic environment, economic policy, and institutional structure in the US economy. Uh, in this slide, we can see a table that uh, presents the data on um, economic growth, unemployment, and income distribution in the United States in the period from 1953 to 2019. Uh, as we can see, there are several important differences in the Keynesian era compared with uh, the neoliberal era. The pace of economic growth in the US varied widely from very slow to very fast during the last seven decades. On average, economic growth reached its uh, highest rate uh, during Keynesian era and has slowed down since then with the intent of slowing down further. The lower GDP growth rate during the crisis of the 1970s and the neoliberal era has been combined with rising unemployment, slower growth of GDP per capita and deteriorating income distribution. Economic growth decreased more slowly than unemployment rate and income inequality increased, especially during the neoliberal era. The secular increase in income inequality suggests that the relationship between economic growth on the one hand and unemployment and income distribution on the other hand is not cyclical, but structural, reflecting institutional failures and bad welfare policy based on anti-regulation and pro-market beliefs in recent decades. In contrast to previous decades, new industries and business models are more intensive in ideas than in employment. The process of creative destruction, according to which new and better industries replace obsolete ones, is more reflected in labor productivity gains, but not so much in employment and wage gains. In such circumstances, it is not surprising that technological progress and the rise in productivity in the US economy during the neoliberal era have been gained at economic and social costs in terms of higher unemployment and rising income inequality. Uh, focus, innovation, and institutional uh, failures. Uh, the interpretation of Stalet's facts 
on economic progress in the United States from institutional perspective, given in the previous section, suggests that technological innovations enable a modern society to overcome resource constraints and enjoy <clears throat> and enjoy a continuous wealth improvements. But this potential is limited by powerful vested interest of corporate capital. As such, innovations are necessary, but not sufficient conditions for economic progress in the sense that progressive technological changes should be accompanied by progressive institutional changes. Relying on this assumption, we consider why innovations in the neoliberal era can be associated with higher unemployment rate and income inequality than in Keynesian era. The fact that new technologies are more disruptive and labor saving today than in the past is only a part of the explanation. It is not to say that uh, benefits of ongoing innovations on welfare improvements uh, should be at the same level and the pace as uh, the effects on past innovations, but the change in the nature of innovations and employment is not enough to explain why higher are the investment and greater number of awarded patents in neoliberal era did not contribute to the standard of living comparable to those of in the Keynesian uh, era. Uh, in this table, we can see that the number of issued patents was almost three times higher on average per year throughout the entire the neoliberal period than in the period between the mid 1950s and the 1970s. The neoliberal, the neoliberal period is also characterized by higher IRD expenditure. On average, uh, the share of IRD expenditure in GDP was by 0.2 percentage points uh, higher each year during, during the neoliberal era. However, higher IRD performance was not transformed at the same rate in technological progress measured by uh, total factor productivity. As we can see from this table, total factor productivity grew after 1980 at uh, only about two thirds of the rate achieved between the mid uh, 1950s and the 1970s. The idea uh, developed here is that the shift in IRD activities from public to private sector should be considered as a factor helping to explain this difference. One of the most radical changes in the US RD performance, which happened during the neoliberal era, is the shift of RD activities from public to private sector. The data in the previous slide uh, showed that the share of federal expenditure in total RD expenditure declined from uh, 62% during Keynesian era, on average, 35% uh, in the neoliberal era. Contrary to public RD investment, business RD, RD expenditure increased uh, during the same period from 35 to 60%. In this way, private sector instead of government becomes a leading RD investors in the United States. The factor that uh, business invests more than the government in RD is not problematic in itself. Moreover, private investment are often more efficient than the government uh, counterpart. However, the high R&D performance of private sector is not only based on its own investment in innovation, but also on government subsidies, expansion of intellectual property rights, and acquisition of startups by tech giants. Uh, from the institutional perspective, the evolution of R&D performance or corporate capital under these circumstances may reflect in favor vested interest of corporate capital at the expense of the common uh, man. The neoclassical uh, economics justifies, okay, thank you. The classical economics justifies RD subsidization by market imperfections associated with RD activities. In short, uh, market failures create a gap between uh, the private and social benefits derived from innovations. Given that uh, returns to society from IRD are higher than those received by private firms, the government should support business IRD investment. Uh, the protection of intellectual property rights uh, through a patent system is seen as a necessary condition that enables an innovator to appropriate the benefits from his inventions. This stimulates investment in IRD and especially commercialization of its application. Uh, these arguments uh, can be criticized from the point of view of the concept of a powerful vested interest of corporate capital chosen in our research. An asymmetry in uh, power in favor of corporate capital raises doubts over the capacity of government to offer an effective counterweight to 
monopolization of innovation by corporate capital and to improve the diffusion of the results of federally funded R&D. The innovation process is characterized by heterogeneity of interests and preferences between innovators, corporate capital and government. Uh, compared to innovators and government, corporate capital is more profit-driven and social rest responsive in R&D investment. As such, corporate capital seeks to establish monopoly control over inventions, knowledge and creative expression of innovators as their employees. In practice, this is done by obtaining a legal protection on innovation in the forms of patents and copyrights or by keeping innovation, innovation secret. A massive accumulation of economic uh, power allows corporate capital to gain control and commodify any innovation that might, might be profitable, even in early stage on inventions, which in turn leads to increase in the number of issued patents. The two pieces of legislation passed in uh, 1980, the Baydol Act and Stevens Sweden Technology Innovation Act, dramatically altered the patent protection in favor of private sector in the case of inventions resulted from government funded research. Proprietarian control over innovation is not limited by corporate capital, but for many individual innovators and small and medium firms of limited means, patent protection on innovation is expensive and time consuming. Uh, although more uh, small and large enterprises in the United States are considered as uh, inno innovation leaders, the US art in performance is dominated by corporate capital. Uh, for the illustration, all companies from the United States, they have appeared on the list of the 50 most uh, innovative companies in the world every year during the last 15 years are at the same time on the list of the biggest companies according to their market capitalization. This suggests that uh, corporate capital, uh, this suggests not only that corporate capital has more access to R&D resources than small business, but also indicates a high concentration of R&D performance in few industries and small number of large companies. Under the described institutional environment, the social cost of patenting and subsidizing RD activities is the skew of distribution of technological benefits toward corporate capital. And uh, finally, conclusion. Uh, this uh, article has contributed to the debate about the impact of innovation economic progress in the United States, taking a perspective offered by old institutionalism. The dominant mainstream view that new technologies are more disruptive and labor saving is seen only as a part, thank you, I see. And uh, are more disrupting labor saving is seen only as a part of explanation why higher RD investment and the greater number of awarded pat patents in the neoliberal era did not contribute to economic progress comparable to those of in the Keynesian era. To explain this difference, we developed the idea that increasing government RD subsidies, expression of um, intellectual property rights, and acquisition of startups by tech giants during the neoliberal era contribute to monopolization of innovation by corporate capital. The evolution of RD performance under these uh, circumstances reflects a powerful, powerful vested interest of corporate capital at the expense of the common man, taking into account the collaborative and cumulative nature of innovation process and incredible productivity of technological uh, progress. Um, thank you for your attention and your uh, questions are uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Novitz, and that was perfect timing as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a way to stop the screen share? So okay. here, I'm, I've got it here. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Novitz. Uh, if you have questions at any point, you can ask them either in the chat uh, or in the question and answer, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should see an option for that. If you don't, click on the button that says more and it should come up. Um, I'll collect the questions and then we'll go through them at the end of the presentations. Uh, up next, we have smartphones, social networks and fake news, institutional economics approach to decision-making in the 21st century by Felipe Almeida and Valeria Mortari. Thank you, Avi. So I'm sharing my screen here. Okay. So 
Uh, this paper was written by Valeria Mortari and me, and this study aims to approach the 21st century era of social networks through institutional economics reading of decision making, specifically studying how building social interaction, emulative logic, and corporate hegemony. Nowadays, smartphones. Smartphones are much more closer to computers than mobile phones. A mobile device used to be an, an important interaction device at the end of 20th century, through which people received and made, made telephone calls. Mobile phones had evolved to smartphones. Today, we check emails, texts, listen to music, take pictures, record videos, surf on the internet, use social networks, and we rarely make calls through our smartphones. Despite the lack of telephone calls, smartphones have become the main asset of interaction at the beginning of 21st century, being specifically popular among youngsters. There is a debate about willingness generated by smartphones and social networks. These willingness are usually loneliness, anxiety, depression, and smartphone addiction. Youngsters are more likely to develop this con those conditions. Studies and research on the problem of using smartphones and social networks usually address the existence of social network as the source of the problem. This paper offers an institutional reading of the harm in using smartphones and social network in which the technology itself is not the key issue. Our criticism of the usual studies on smartphones and social networks relies on those studies point out instrumentalism as the problem of smartphones and social networks. Usually, the key issue, the, the issue is that smartphones and social networks have a negative impact on society. We agree with this statement for different reasons. It's not a terrible thing having a computer called a smartphone. We can find places and information wherever we are. We can call a driver of food delivery 24 seven. We can receive information real time social networks are not terrible either. They help us to establish connections with old friends or communicate with relatives live on the other side of the earth, for instance. Hence, the possibilities generated by smartphones and social network in our lives are amazing. From this perspective, it is hard to see what the problems are because they are ceremonial and our description was instrumental. Problems he regarding the use of smartphones and social network are not in their technology. The problem is us. The problem are the institutions that build us. Today's institutions are not very different from those in the press social networks world. The main difference is, as connection is in the core of using smartphones and social networking, we deal with institutions more intensively than before. This is what smartphones and social networks provide. Nowadays, institutions are out there in our minds and vibrating or beeping in our pockets. Every time we check our social networks, institutions get strongly reinforced. Consumption, hobbies, daily actions, work activities of people who are who of people who are close or people we would like to be close to us. Powerful reinforce habits of thought and lifestyles. This paper addressed that habits and lifestyles are the key problems of smartphone and social networks. They are the ceremonialism that encapsulate instrumentalism. The key issue being the same as that identified by trust available in the civil institutions of a predatory society in the world of smartphones and social networking. The observation of the institution is more intense than ever before. In the past, when people were at home, they were less exposed to institutional pressure. 
to deal with institutions, people had to watch TV or read a magazine. Today, even at home, people are much more exposed to institutions because they are pushing their smartphones. It is the calling of ceremonialism. Smartphones are, and social networks made imbecile institutions much more present and active in our daily life. Additionally, the traffic showing is very intense in social networks. Usually there is no place for sadness, failures or boringness. Social network users observe very intensely ceremonial issues in our society, generate more pressure to show social achievements. Another main criticism of social networks relies on the persuasion of users. This criticism affirms that social network, a big business focused on selling things. Again, the key issue is the institutions of our society and persuasion as part of them. Institutions regularly persuade decision makers to buy goods and follow certain lifestyles. It's not social network that persuade us. Society has been persuading us since barbaric times and social networks only intensify our interaction with institutions. There is no limit to persuading a social network user and even truth is not excluded. For instance, social networks have made fake news a serious contemporary social problem. Fake news is not a product of social networks. They have been part of our society since the recorded history. For example, slavery and colonialism relied on fake news. Fake news is a ceremonialism that justifies domination. In the past, a society would claim to be stronger, more developed, or democratic, and then it would dominate our societies. These are ceremonial justifications for domination. When presidents are elected with the support from fake news, fake news are used for domination. The reason social networks make fake news a serious problem is the combination of uh, an intense contact of users with institutions and the consumption of information through social networks. The reason for this is that information consumed through social networks can be separated from sources and only a fragment of the whole information can be shown leading to misinformation. Additionally, social network users tend to consume news by reading only red lines, which are in most cases sensationalists and provide incomplete and superficial knowledge about the subject. Furthermore, bubble effects are common in social networks. Social networks enable people to get together and establish relationship with those who share the same set of ideas. It does not generate shock or tension, not only plurality and evolution of different ideas. On the other hand, in social networks, users can choose to be in contact with a specific kind of people and have the ability to unfriend or unfollow those who do not share the same ideas. Hence, social network users are more likely to consume information offered by people who are more like-minded or congruent with their ideas. Thus, social network users create an interaction bubble, meaning that people interact with those who have similarities, similar opinions and ideas, and consume information provided from those carrying similarities. Nowadays, social network users are manipulated through fake news to discredit science and build scientific facts without scientific evidence, such as the flat earth. It is, it, it is a way to dominate people's decision-making through a Lysenko effect. The consumption of information through social networks can give the feeling of wisdom improvement to users when they could actually shatter the critical capacity of thinking. 
Furthermore, as Professor William Duggar noted, the 20th century institutions became dominated by corporate hegemony. Hence, the instrumentalism of the social network was inserted in the ceremonialism of corporate hegemony institutions and obviously encapsulated by it. The only reason that there are social networks is that they were encapsulated by institutions dominated by corporate logic. Instrumentally, social networks can be about connecting people and in our society ceremonialism, they are about achieving corporative ends. Evidently, persuading us to buy products is a key corporative end. Users have flagged their view of the world in their social networks. They present themselves how they would like to be seen and they connect with people they like. They build a social network persona that interacts with other created personas. From an Avenblenian perspective, people try to offer a status showing versions of themselves, a version that would triumph in the modern barbaric world. It is one layer of the corporate hegemony in social networks. The, the influencer is another layer. An influencer is a model that was institutionalized or had its institutional, in, institutionalization reinforced by social networks. An influencer means the status without the power of a celebrity in social networks. This status reinforced lifestyles and the emulative process. Not only is the lifestyle of an influencer emulated, but also her or his celebrity feature. To be an influencer becomes an enabling myth. As social network users emulate being an influencer by understanding that she or he has the job of posting her or his life on a social network, a modern times conspicuous leisure. Obviously, an influencer is a social network spotify for goods to be conspicuously emulated. It is common business enterprise sending their products as gifts to influencers who give back by showing the products in their timelines. Sometimes showing those gifts is ex explicit. Influencers inform that they are displaying a product that was given to them. Other times, influencers introduce gifts by product placement in their posts. Influencers can also have a great importance in building and supporting the bubble effect as social network users tend to have a great confidence in information provided by influencers. Moreover, the believability of face information has more command when it comes from influencers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe and Valeria. Sure. There we go. Um, I see a few people have posted questions. Thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, please continue to either post your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, and once all the presenters have gone through, I'll go kind of in order of when they came in um, for the Q&A section. Next up, we have the non-evolutionary and non-benign character of stylized facts by Jacob Powell. All right, let me just share. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, non-evolutionary, non-benign character of stylized facts. It's nice to be seeing people on a screen again even though it's not in person and chatting about these fun things and seeing what people are working on. So today, um, just an overview uh, of the presentation. What are stylized facts? What are we looking at? What do I mean by non-evolutionary character? And I'm also gonna use examples throughout to kind of try to demonstrate this non-benign character, specifically talking about some ideas of performativity. Doxa, which is an idea I'm drawing from Pierre Bourdieu. Um, Docs is just this idea of a common sense belief that's non-benign or a habit of thought and in institutional language that's non-benign. And then kind of reflexivity is this way of dealing with stylized facts, tendency to take on a non-evolutionary character. 
Um, again, another kind of idea that comes out of Bordeaux, but we'll get to it all as we go. So Stalinist facts, the term originates really with Caldor in 1961. And he says, since facts as recorded by statisticians are always subject to numerous snags and qualifications, and for that reason are incapable of being accurately summarized, the theorists in my view should feel free, should be free to start off with the stylized view of the facts. I concentrate on broad tendencies, ignoring individual detail, and proceed on the as if method, i.e. construct a hypothesis that could account for these stylized facts without necessarily committing himself on the historical accuracy or sufficiency of the facts or tendencies thus summarized, which is a big fancy way of saying stylized facts are just simple empirical regularities in need of explanation, right? There's just these broad general tendencies that we see empirically that we need to explain. And really stylized facts, I remember encountering them first as I'm sure most of us do in like my first graduate macroeconomics course. Like these are the stylized facts of the economy. These are the stylized facts of the business cycle, right? Unemployment's counter-cyclical, inflation's pro-cyclical, consumption is pro-cyclical. And there's nothing like about stylized facts in their nature that's non-evolutionary. Um, and this really kind of comes out like Lawson had a paper in 1989 where he really talked about how stylized facts are these useful tools, right? Stylized facts are abstractions and can be useful and emanate from like an evolutionary approach to social science in so much as they're abstractions used to tease out the underlying institutional processes generating the phenomena. When they take on a non-evolutionary character, it's more when they're abstra these abstractions are actually getting farther away from understanding the generating structures. So from the examples that I'm gonna use throughout this paper, I'm gonna pick two really to kind of show how stylized facts can take on this non-evolutionary character and play out in non-benign ways. And the two stylized facts I'm choosing are the inverse trade-off between changes in unemployment and changes in price level, the Phillips curve, and um, countries with debt to GDP ratios in excess of 90% experience lower GDP growth, right? The famous infinite or famous or infamous Reinhardt and Rogoff, 2009, 2010. And I'll use these throughout. So the non-evolutionary character of stylized facts. So again, there's nothing like inherent in stylized facts that makes them not evolutionary, right? And I'm, I was thinking when I was reading like Veblen's Why is Economics Not an Evolutionary Science? He says, right, it's not that Orthodox economics or non-evolutionary economics doesn't deal with facts, they deal with facts. It's not that they're not trying to explain processes, they are trying to explain processes, but it's more in like the habits of thought animating the approach, right? In, in the methodological foundations, right? In trying to find it epistemological, an evolutionary epistemology and evolutionary ontology. So it's really about the habits of thought and the ways that stylized facts are being dealt with. So for the first example, thinking about the non-evolutionary character, the first example, the Phillips curve or the trade-off between changes in unemployment, changes in price level. It comes out of the work of Phillips, surprise, surprise, 1958, doing inductive work, looking at the relationship between unemployment and nominal wages in England through a specific, over a specific time period. Which is interesting, and that's really not the Phillips curve that we think of today when we draw like our inverse line in our head or we put them on the board for our students um, between price level and unemployment rather than nominal wages. The one that we think of today really comes out of the work of Phelps and Friedman, right? And what's interesting is this kind of inductive relationship that came out of the work of Phillips took on this very like deductive, okay, we're assuming this trade-off. It took on like this time invariant, spatial invariant character. And then when used to like create the, a hypothesis such as like the Nehru that came, comes directly out of the 1968 uh, Friedman presidential address. And then later the natural rate of unemployment justification. So the way that this in, in my mind is taken on a non-evolutionary character is in two ways. One, it's taken something that was discovered through inductive methods in a specific time and place to like this deductive spatially time invariant nature to be kind of assumed and then erect models upon, right? And the problem is that this relationship really in its most base form broke down in the 1970s in the United States. But we see like paper after paper, specifically in the Orthodox literature that's reinvestigating the Phillips curve. Is the Phillips curve flattening? Does it still exist? But the really interesting thing is often at the end, if a Phillips curve isn't found, it's often a conversation that takes place around misclassification of the model rather than like, does the empirical relationship actually still exist, right? Because, which is highlighting this assumed nature that's kind of going into it. If it wasn't assumed, you would always be asking, well, does the relationship no longer exist instead of automatically defaulting to this must be misspecification, this must be misspecification. Um, and there's really no theory or process of cumulative causation that's generating this phenomena embedded in that um, kind of orthodox theory of Phillips curve-esque 
things, right? The, 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 what's typically purported today after the breakdown of the traditional Phillips curve in the 1970s, we saw the move to the Nairu and now the natural rate of unemployment is this theoretical fiction, right? Where if inflation isn't happening, oh, we thought, I guess the natural rate of unemployment is lower than we thought it was. And we just kind of keep moving the ball wherever we need to rationalize the economic phenomena that's occurring. Again, emblematic of this like assumed relationship or a zero sum between these two things. For our second example, countries with debt to GDP ratios in excess of 90% experience lower growth. Again, coming out of Reinhardt and Rogoff's um, infamous work. You know, they say, this is, comes from the 2010 paper that was actually presented at this conference. Our empirical research on the history of financial crisis and the relationship between growth and public liabilities supports the view that current debt trajectories are, a risk, are at risk to long-term growth and stability with many advanced economies reaching already reaching or exceeding the important maker marker of 90% of GDP. Now, in terms of thinking about this as like a non-evolutionary character is one of the things like Lawson points out when he's talking about taking a realist approach to stylized facts is, again, we're using assumptions to get at the, the generating economic phenomena underlying this like, what's happening? What are we seeing? What's going on? But what's happening here is the broadness of their data which they're using over multiple countries over multiple years is actually like eschewing the institutional factors that are important in determining what led to increasing debt to GDP ratios to be correlated with, to be correlated with low growth rates. And they, and they use Barrow's um, concept of Ricardian equivalence to like theoretically justify this. Again, I would argue this is another theoretical fiction, right? The idea that, oh, people see that government spending now, they're going to tax later, so now I'm going to save, as if everyone has a savings account, but again, beyond the scope of this paper to get upset about borrows, Ricardian equivalents. Um, again, Narcissian and Ray kind of, I know probably everyone's thinking about Herndon, when's he going to get to Herndon, they messed up the data, I'm going to get to Herndon, I promise, but Narcissian and Ray, before you even get to the problems in the data, point out that one, you need to account for the institutional differences, you can't just lump all these countries together and make assumptions about the implications of debt to GDP ratios, right? Different countries with different institutional arrangements have different levels of monetary sovereignty. Again, I'm couching this in a very MMT approach. Um, so countries with a high level of monetary sovereignty or those that are currency issuers with floating exchange rates, such as the US have very different implications, like debt to GDP ratios have very different implications on those economies than a country with very low monetary sovereignty, for example, such as Greece, which really is a currency user, right? Due to the monetary union and, and whatnot. The other point that Narcissi and Ray point out is they're mistaking correlation for causation, right? And what Narcissi and Ray are pointing to is you have a recession, automatic stabilizers kick in, which by definition increase the gov increased government debt, lead to increasing government debt to GDP ratios, and then you have lower growth. And they're kind of making the step of, well, lower growth directly correlated to increasing debt to GDP ratios, instead of correlating lower growth to a couple steps back, the recession that just occurred, right? So another point being made. Again, the bigger, the biggest factor in it being non-evolutionary is you're shooing away from the institutional factors generating it, using a theoretical fiction to then justify the empirical findings and justify policies such as austerity, which is a nice segue into the non-benign character of stylized facts, right? Economics as a social science is inherently performative, right? We're part of the object that we're studying. And again, performative discourse, we can te technically define it as one that contributes to the construction of the reality that it seeks to describe, right? And, and, and this is one of the things that I think institutional economics, we're fortunate enough, deals with well in terms of overcoming this dualism of describing versus prescribing or positive versus normative by rejecting this dualism right out of the bat. To make choices about what a style, what style is fact to study, you're automatically directing inquiry. You're making choices about, well, this should be studied, right? You're, there's no, you can't separate these two things. And style facts are a really good example of this. Moreover, stylized facts in this non binary character can take on a doxic quality, what Bordeaux called doxa. Doxa was, again, for Bordeaux, common sense beliefs or habits of thought and institutional language, which are non benign or what we might call ceremonial beliefs. And stylized facts are social constructions that are socialized into the next generation of economists and often become taken for granted. They become our common sense. They're not the, co the lay common sense, but they become like this common sense of the scholar that, okay, we know our style is facts, now we can start building our models. But there's no step that says, well, wait a second, are, are we okay with these stylized facts? 
So the nominine character of stylized facts, one, the Phillips curve is a doxic institution, I would argue, in the sense that it's been socialized into us as common sense. If you look at the introductory textbook of every macroeconomic, like introductory level, like undergraduate level, you find an inverse Phillips curve drawn in the back of it. It drives me insane. I just want to like tear the page out of the back of the book. Because again, if that relationship broke down in the 70s, why are we always drawing an inverse curve? Why when I, when I invoke Phillips curve in your mind, you automatically draw an inverse curve instead of just thinking about an empirical relationship with no functional form. It's because we've been socialized to see it in a certain way and that animates our habits of thought in terms of our inquiry. And in doing so, it, it creates these policymakers such as the Fed to think about unemployment and stable price levels as a zero sum game, which again, isn't necessarily the case. There hasn't been wage push inflation in the US since the 1950s, my light went out, since the 1950s with the brief exception of 1973. The majority of inflationary episodes, which have been rare in the United States that we have seen have come from commodity price shocks. But as Gelbroth points out, we never come up with a non-accelerating rate of oil production, right? The emphasis is always on the worker. So the Fed's choosing stable prices that benefit asset holders or certain economic class over pro-employment policies, which would benefit workers under the guise or the specter of possibility of inflation, because they're still operating in this zero sum common sense toxic world that is the Phillips curve. Even though it's changed its character, I know we don't think about it in the same traditional Phillips curve, but we now we've moved to the natural rate. The trade-off is still justified theoretically. The non-benign character of stylized facts of example two is R and R stylized facts is really yet to take on what we might call a doxic character in the sense that it's not as common sense as the Phillips curve, right? We don't open every introductory textbook and see debt to GDP ratios lead to bad economic growth, but it has been used to perpetuate or justify the theoretical fiction that is Ricardian equivalence, which is problematic in the sense that it could reinforce Ricardian equivalence as a common sense almost approach to economic policy. But it's really its non-benign character comes in its justification for austerity policies, right? In many of the EU countries, due to the monetary sovereignty, the institutions that regulate their monetary sovereignty in response to increasing public debt have turned to austerity. And what we've seen this lead to in very non-benign ways is stagnating growth, sustained levels of unemployment, increasing inequality, right? Those of us that have studied Keynes or in the post-Keynesian tradition, thanks, Avi, um, know that if you suck off the public money in the time of recession, it's going to continue to spiral downwards, right? So it's, it's actually leading to the opposite of what is necessary. So how do we move forward? Really, Lawson's 1989 paper, I think, is spectacular in talking about how we should use stylized facts. What's the right way to use them? When are they useful? How do we maintain principles of realism and evolutionary approach? And he lays out three steps of inquiry. We want to identify an empirical phenomenon of interest, construct a model or explanation of that empirical phenomena, and then subject the models and explanations to further and continuous scrutiny, right? I, I completely agree. Lawson and I are on the same page. But I would argue that Lawson doesn't go far enough and that we need a fourth step. And this is this idea of reflexivity as a way of undoing docs, as a way of going back to that first step where we identify the empirical phenomena and start to attack that and see, is this what we wanna be studying? How was the calculations made? Has the relationship broken down now? And kind of going back to what's being taken for granted. So this idea of reflexivity, again, it comes out of Bordeaux and it's really where the process whereby a researcher is continually interrogating what is being taken for granted in the research? Now, again, I want to make a quick caveat. Reflexivity is not unique to Bourdieu. It's, it's a term that goes through all of social sciences and takes on different meanings. But for Bourdieu, he argued reflexivity is a process for the researcher to interrogate what's being taken for granted, to kind of look inward, to deconstruct the pre-constructed, right? Stylized facts take on this pre-constructed character. They might be found by, like, for example, by Phillips in, in 1957 through inductive methods, and they're being constructed, but as they're socialized into the next generation of economists, they're not doing those calculations. They take on this pre-constructed character, this given character, this we can take for granted character to then build models upon. Now there's a functionality to the pre-constructed nature of stylized facts. Language is pre-constructed. We have to internalize certain things that are pre-constructed as it facilitates our ability to engage with discourse, to know that we, to use similar language, to share ideas. So it's, there's not like the pre-constructed itself is functional. And even Lawson points this out that there is something pre-constructed about that stylized facts and take on, but just because they're functional, like the pre-constructed is functional, doesn't mean it's non-benign, right? So, and, 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 and another way of saying this is 
heuristics are useful, but we need to be vigilant about the heuristics that we're using, right? So we cannot let the pre-constructed start to direct inquiry or, or policy conclusions without reflexivity continually attacking and interrogating the foundations upon which were these kind of ideas are coming from, right? So Bordeaux, this isn't necessarily an individualistic pursuit, but we want to build reflexivity as part of what he would say the academic habitus or set of dispositions within the academic or the habits of thought of the academic, which again, I think is very similar to Veblen's 1898 paper saying, it's not about whether we deal with facts or not, or whether we're thinking about processes, it's about changing the habits of thought and, the, and that are animating the inquiry and incorporating reflexivity as part of one of those quintessential steps in that habit of thought. So again, kind of moving forward, we have seen reflexivity and action to some extent. There's been a number of challenges from heterodox economists to the Phillips curve framework, but it's yet to really change the consensus. There's been attacks on the natural rate, showing that the Phillips curve doesn't really exist anymore, showing that you know, wage push inflation is a nonity since we've destroyed all working class institute, like working class power in the United States. They can't translate fluctuations in unemployment into any wage gains. Um, but again, there has been yet to change consensus. Now one might say, well, there's a lot of orthodox papers investigating the Phillips curve. But again, they're always falling back to, is this a misclass of misspecification error rather than has the empirical relationship broken down? And I think that highlights the non-evolutionary approach. A good example, I think, of reflexivity is really the work that Herndon et al. did, right, in 2014, replicating, you know, one of the few that were able to get, thanks, Avi, to get access to the data and replicate the work of r and And they showed that there was highly dubious methodological choices and calculation errors, and ultimately showed there really isn't a specific threshold between debt to GDP ratios, right? r and Reinhardt and Rogoff responded in 2013 saying they never argued causation, but an article they wrote in Bloomberg in 2011 would be evidence to the contrary under the title of too much debt means the economy can't grow, right? So they obviously did argue causation. Moreover, we're making these large policy choices that are affecting people's lives. And again, Hearn and all continue on stylized facts and say a necessary condition for establishing a stylized fact is that the calculation on which such facts are based are accurate and that the results of such calculations are robust across alternative reasonable method of methods and calculations. So just in conclusion, stylized facts are useful when abstractions are used to get at the underlying economic structures generating the economic phenomena. I think Lawson is a great starting point for how do we think about using stylized facts, but we need that next step of reflexivity, deconstructed the preconstruction and attack and changing our habits of thought, especially given that stylized facts are non-benign. Thank you. How about that, Avi? Not bad. Well done. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jacob. All right, um, I'm seeing more questions come in. So yeah, again, you know, feel free to ask them in the chat or in the Q&A section uh, at any time. We'll get to them after all the presentations. Up next, we have whose state and whose economy? Buchanan, Samuels, and the Positive Theory of Public Choice by Luke Petach. I hope I pronounced your last name correct. Uh, Petach, but Petach. close enough. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. And can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, so the title of this, my paper here is Who's State and Who's Economy? Buchanan, Samuels, and the Positive Theory of Public Choice. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on kind of where this paper comes from. I'll preview the main argument, get into the debate between Samuels and Buchanan, uh, talk about Warren Samuel's specific framework for public choice theory as it's distinguished from Buchanan uh, and others who are more traditionally associated with public choice and then get into one particular application, although in, in the paper, which is uploaded on the conference website, I, I, there's three applications of Samuel's framework. For the sake of this talk, I'm just going to talk about one, which is Samuel's alternative interpretation of the Coase theorem. Um, and so, the, you know, the, this paper comes out of actually, you know, me reading uh, the calculus of consent and other works by Buchanan and thinking, okay, well, one, I think Buchanan's wrong about a lot of things, um, but two, that uh, progressive economists, particularly institutionalist post-Keynesian economists, would actually benefit from engaging with the public choice perspective, and in fact, that under, you know, taking these criticisms seriously could enhance our work. Uh, and looking at the literature, you know, that comes from institutional or post-Keynesian writers, there's a number of criticisms of public choice theory that run the gamut from, 
criticizing the predictive content of public choice to questions about ideological motivation. You know, uh, McLean's book, Democracy and Chains, famously coming out in 2017, although some of that account's been contested elsewhere. But basically, it, you know, what most of the response to public choice theory comes down to uh, is an aversion to its apparent normative implications. So Steve Pressman has a great 2004 paper in the journal post Keynesian economics where he says at bottom the problem is that public choice theory begins with an ideological aversion to government and a religious worship of the market the anti-government ideology has blinded the entire public choice school and so while steve's paper is very good i actually think that it's not clear that the positive content of public choice theory understood as a just a description of political and public sector behavior and the interaction between law and economics necessitates the normative conclusions that you know institutionalist post Keynesians would be averse to. And so as a way of illustrating this, there's a very helpful debate that occurred in the early 1970s between Warren Samuels, longtime editor of the Journal of Economic Issues, and James Buchanan over the Supreme Court case, Miller et al. v. Schoen. Um, and what I think this episode in the history of economic thought shows is that you know, in particular, the work of Warren Samuels uh, reveals an alternative conception of public choice theory that's divorced from the anti-governmental stance associated with Buchanan and others. That is, Warren, what Warren Samuels' work really illustrates is a institutionalist approach to public choice, and that there's a lot to be gained from this approach. And, and that we can see Warren Samuels' work recenters concerns about power and redistribution as an appropriate object of study for the public choice theorist. Uh, and then in the paper, I discuss three areas where taking Samuels' framework for public choice can provide new insights. Uh, the theory of rent seeking, the Coase theorem, and redistributive policy. Here at the end of the talk, I'm just going to focus on the Coase theorem in this talk just because of time, but the other two are in the paper. So what is the Supreme Court case? So Miller et al. v. Schoen basically involved a dispute um, between owners of red cedar trees and apple trees. Um, so this seems like, okay, how is this case significant? Uh, well, basically it, it boils down to, there's a disease in red cedar trees that is relatively harmless to red cedar trees, but will kill apple orchards. And Virginia in 1914 passed a law that empowered the state entomologists to investigate and condemn certain cedar trees if they threatened an apple orchard. Um, in Miller et al., uh, owners of cedar trees were plaintiffs in error in that they unsuccessfully brought suit in state courts, suing to say, suing to say no, uh, you know, the, the state can't condemn uh, our cedar trees just because they're, you know, near an apple orchard. And what the court held was that it, it rejected the plaintiff's suit. It said it would have been no less a choice if instead of enacting the present statute, the state by doing nothing had permitted serious injury to the apple orders to go unchecked. When forced with such a choice, the state does not exceed its constitutional powers by deciding upon the destruction of one class of property in order to save another. That is, what this case illustrates is the necessity of choice on behalf of the government and, and, the, and the fact that the government is not just a neutral arbiter in the way that public choice theory uh, with its emphasis on the unanimity criterion would advocate, but in fact that the state must, does and must make value judgments. And so Samuels argues that from this case, we can elaborate three principles of a positive theory of public choice. The first is that there is a necessity of choice on behalf of the government. The second is that, you know, from this, the, the government is a role, is a dependent variable in the economy. That is different actors and, and, and agents uh, will attempt to use government to further their own economic ends, uh, which this is, of course, common uh, to people who are from a different normative stance than Samuels, like Buchanan also acknowledge this, and that there's an interrelationship between the economy as an object of legal control and the law as a means for seeking private economic gain. So importantly, Samuels' discussion of the case doesn't, in this entire first paper, Samuels doesn't ever ask the question, uh, how should government act, but he's just seeking to explain why government acts the way it does. And so Miller at all v. Schoen provides a prism for understanding that question. What Samuels argues is that it, it offers a pretty straightforward contradiction of Buchanan's preference for the unanimity principle uh, as a norm or, or the Pareto rule as a rule for 
choice on behalf of the government. Uh, you know, Samuel's rights damned if it did, damned if it didn't. Government had to choose between the promotion of one group or the other. Government is in both cases a participant. So there was no way, right, whether or not the government said we're going to condemn the cedar trees or we're going to let red cedar rust persist and have, have the apple trees die. The government was making a value judgment one way or another, and there was no way for it not to. So Samuels doesn't endorse one choice or other in, in, in this particular case, but he's only illustrating that the government must, in fact, choose. And so he says that we should reject the unanimity criterion or the Pareto criterion here because it provides no guidance for actions uh, in cases where neither action nor inaction would receive consent, right? Miller et al. be shown being an example. It doesn't matter what the government did, neither, neither acting nor not acting would receive unanimous consent. So how can it act as a normative guide? The government has to choose anyway. Okay. Uh, so to the extent that unanimity can't provide guidance, the government has to appeal to some justific justificatory criteria. And so the second question facing the public choice theory, as Samuels argues, is what factors influence the government's choice of justificatory criteria? So this is the role of government as a dependent variable. And Samuels argues it's the interest groups acting on the government are what influence that government choice. Again, he's not saying government should act this way. He's only saying one, you know, the government has to choose. Unanimity is, is not a normative guide because it doesn't describe most situations. And two, how is government influenced in its choosing? Well, through interest groups acting on the government, hence the role of government is a dependent variable. Uh, so a year later, Buchanan writes a follow-up response in the Journal of Law and Economics where he lays out three objections. He says, one, Samuels ignores the possibility of coast-type internalization. Um, so that is, you know, in, in saying government has to choose, Samuels ignores the possibility that cedar tree owners and apple tree owners could have uh, had property rights been clearly defined and there have been low transaction costs. Uh, you know, bargain to internalize the red cedar rust externality. Two, even if the Coase theorem fails, Samuel's double, or sorry, Buchanan doubles down here on the unanimity criteria. Again, not really responding to Samuel's initial point that the unanimity rule or Pareto criteria doesn't apply here. And three, um, he gets into the weeds a bit, but basically, even if it's some prior constitutional stage, it was determined that majority rule was optimal such that some Pareto inferior allocations could be expected to emerge during ordinary politics. Uh, Buchanan thinks the court's decision uh, in a, allocating property rights in a way that, you know, affected economic value represents an abdication of its judicial mandate. So that's Buchanan's response. And the same issue, Samuels has a rejoinder. And he basically says, we're not doing the same thing here. Um, that, Buchanan's entire response is about whether or not the government's action in Miller v. Schoen was justified, which is not a question Samuels even takes up in his analysis. His entire analysis is about why the government had to act in the way it did, which is, that's really what public choice theory is about. And so here Samuels, the institutionalist, is, is basically taking Buchanan, the, one of the founders of public choice theory, to school on how to do public choice theory. So, and so Samuels has this long quote, whereas mine is an attempt to describe what did happen. Buchanan's is an evaluation of the case in terms of his normative model and a statement of what might have, would have, or indeed should have happened. Uh, more simply, uh, Buchanan is, or sorry, Samuels is a little catty here, but I really like this. He says, Buchanan is critical of me for describing legal economic reality when that reality fails to conform to his normative model. And, and that's basically, I think, what's going on. And he also points out that Buchanan's model is itself one approach to the use of government. So this is the debate in the Journal of Law and Economics. What's also nice here is there's private correspondence between Samuels and Buchanan that was later published in the Journal of Economic Issues. When, and I think this private correspondence helps shed light on Samuel's framework and, and as well as his critique. Um, and so kind of three additional criticisms that come out of this private correspondence is that one, Samuel says the unanimity is a, the basis for social change, limits the scope of public choice theory to the analysis of choice within opportunity sets, when really one objective is a public choice theory should be studying how opportunity sets are formed. And to the big one, stepping back to the original articles in the Journal of Law and Economics, is that Buchanan's framework ignores the in inevitability of non-Pareto optimal choice by government. 
But importantly, Samuels in this correspondence emphasizes why this matters is because it, it leads public choice theory uh, to ignore distributional issues. So if you ignore the fact that government has to make non Pareto optimal choices, uh, you, you're going to miss the distributional implications of uh, public choice. And lastly, that Buchanan mistakes that even if you know the unit following the unanimity rule is possible, it, it actually doesn't imply the absence of coercion. Um, and so just a little bit more on, on these points that Samuels makes. So again, you know, unanimity is of no use uh, as a normative guide if it, 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 government doesn't receive unanimous consent in action or inaction. You know, it can't possibly follow the rule. And it's also not positively descriptive of government action. So it's not clear what the rule of unanimity, Pareto optimality, what use it has. More importantly, it attaches an arbitrary weight to the privileged and the status quo. So it has these distributional implications that Samuel emphasize, Samuels emphasizes. He says, as, an attra as attractive as the consent unanimity rule is, it places too much power in the hands of the already privileged, indeed cementing their mortgage upon the future, and it fails to comport with the experience and realities of public choice. In other words, in part, it reinforces the power of the powerful and the status quo to produce non Pareto optimal changes, not subject to the exogenous controls themselves, and it does it by giving it a veto. That is, it, it basically prefers the status quo and gives those in power and the status quo the power to maintain uh, existing resource allocations uh, and distribution of resources uh, by giving them a veto. And that there's going to be coercion even in a market relying upon contracts. The problem is not coercion or no coercion, but coercion within which institutional or power structure. And that's really the question for the public choice theorist. Um, as kind of a corollary to this, you know, he notes that Buchanan doesn't address the issue of power. And the question of power is always about the power of alpha being relative to the power of beta. And so you know, if you cut the size of the government, the question becomes whose power is enhanced if government power is reduced. And focusing only on a lack of unanimous consent in government decision making misses the possibility of equally pernicious concentrations of private power. So Samuels writes that if Howard Hughes were the nation's or the system's sole capitalist, we would be just as socialized as if we had a traditional socialist regime in terms of the central, the, the degree of centralization and planning that was involved. Okay. And so ultimately, he concludes it's not a question of government or no government, which is how Buchanan poses the problem of public choice theory, but rather which government or which interest government is to support, because acting or not, it's always supporting some interest. And that's the question of what interest and why is the question for the public choice theorist. And so Samuel's later work reveals kind of different interpretations of important topics in political economy and public choice theory, in particular rent seeking the Coase theorem and redistribution. Here I'll just focus on the Coase theorem as an example. Um, and so the Coase theorem is two parts, the assignment of property rights and transaction costs as a market solution to externalities and to the allocative neutrality of rights. Samuel's criticism of the typical public choice approach to the Coase theorem involves a uh, response to the purported allocative neutrality of rights. Uh, you know, the, nor the usual normative takeaway from point two is that judges should avoid attempting to allocate resources from the bench because regardless of how property rights are assigned, we can expect the Pareto optimal allocation to emerge uh, as long as transaction costs are low and, and parties are, are allowed to exchange. Um, but Samuels argues that if we take the theorem at face value, actually it's not a, a lot of the supposed normative implications that the have been touted are not so clear. So one, even if the Cosian conclusion is correct, that rights are allocatively neutral, there's actually nothing in the positive content of the Coase theorem that necessitates a preference for market-friendly assignment of property rights. In fact, if we expect the same allocation to emerge, regardless of how property rights are assigned, you actually need some secondary justification to not do an egalitarian assignment of rights, because otherwise, um, you know, you're losing, uh, you, you're imposing a cost on someone by assigning an in inegalitarian assignment, and it's not clear why that would be justified. So actually, the Coase theorem is itself an argument for assigning rights in a very egalitarian way, which is not how it's often interpreted. But it's actually, the more important point, arguably, is that 
it's not correct that rights are not allocatively neutral because affecting out changing property rights uh, impacts the distribution of wealth and income. And they'll only be allocatively neutral if you maintain the partial equilibrium assumption of a fixed income or wealth distribution. If you drop that assumption, changing property rights will change the allocation of resources. So again, points to the importance of analyzing distribution as part of public choice theory. Um, and so kind of summing up, you know, Buchanan in the original debate wrote that old arguments are important only if they shed light on matters of modern relevance. I, that quote applies here to this paper as well. Uh, well, you know, so hopefully this has, you know, not just been a, a, a useless endeavor, but it does in fact shine light on issues of modern relevance. While public choice theory has long been the domain of economists with ideological aversion to government action, what this episode shows, and in particular the work of Warren Samuels, illustrates is that this doesn't need to be the case, that there is an institutionalist approach to public choice theory. And Samuels puts it thusly, the key questions always were, whose state, for example, whose democracy, and whose economy, for example, whose capitalism? And I think these questions are too important to be left for those to whom the answer is decided in advance. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Luke. Um, seeing more questions come in, thank you. Continue to ask them. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Smita Srinivas talking about the consequences of institutional variety and Ayers Veblen lag for technology and economic development. And I do want to point out that this was the Clarency Ayers Award winner this year. So whenever you are ready. Can you hear me? All set? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better group ahead of me. Um, including uh, Jacob, Luke, and everyone else, which is you, you set the stage nicely for some of the issues here. So I came to the topic thinking about what it would be to consider the question of lag in uh, the context of a, a complex industrial system. And over the last um, several months, particularly during COVID, where I have been involved in a lot of policy engagement, it's become increasingly clear to me that one of the issues uh, uh, that policy design struggles with is not so much that pol politicians and bureaucrats don't listen to the experts, quote unquote, but that the experts themselves are struggling to frame the issues in ways in which the methods and the evidence can be parsed uh, to um, connect to the sort of realism that policymakers think they must actually execute on. And so in this process of dealing with a lot of different disciplinary conversations, it's really come to me that one of the challenges has been this uh, concept of uh, what might be seen as technological advance, the kind of methodologies we used to study that advance, and what we think of as uh, more progressive and regressive tendencies about the advance. Um, let me see how I can move my screen ahead. There you go. So without, uh, in to this audience in particular, um, overemphasizing what heirs did or did not do, since I think many of you have studied heirs in great detail, I was particularly struck by the way in which adaptation um, in the context of an industrial economy was actually put across. And you can see in this list here that I will not read that this refinement that the original institutional economics does so well is really to try and capture some of the cultural aspects of the adaptation relative to what might be seen as the technological advance uh, that is in play. Now, they differ, of course, in exactly how they describe what is the adaptation versus what is the technology. But if for a moment I take the argument that Ayers is really trying to build an argument of a technological continuum, he is really 
interested in building on an understanding of an industrially sophisticated system. But of course, historically, this is the US economy, and by and large, a lot of the debate in the original institutional economics is what we would think of as the North Atlantic economies. Now, this isn't obviously a negative. This allows us to understand how historically we have tended to see industrial systems. But on the left here, where you see this little picture of these kids, uh, this was the UNICEF um, State of the World's Children Report, which I was involved with. The understanding is that countries tend to be differentiated across from low and middle income or richer countries. And actually when UNICEF or many other multilateral agencies imagine the sphere of development, they are really not thinking about heirs and Beblin. And in a way, uh, for someone like myself, who's coming into this debate much more from an industrial development perspective in many of the low and middle income economies, we should ask perhaps, is there another way in which to frame the debate so that what we would consider to be the heirs Veblen lag might end up geographically, philosophically, or even technologically much more contextual. So my argument really isn't that institutional lag is not important, but it's really rather that institutional variety is much more so and requires explicit attention. Now, we know that when we think of institutional um, institutions, whether we think of them as norms, um, customs or laws, we have to think in the specific industrial context uh, we're discussing. And for someone um, who is working on the, say the microeconomics of a particular technology system, the particular institutions become especially important. So we might, for example, think of technical standards, food and safety standards. We might need to think about particular issues of property rights, patent law, and so on. So when we think of the institutional variety that might exist in an industrial system, what we're really saying is there might not only be multiple markets, multiple safety standards, multiple ways of protecting property rights, but somehow philosophically and conceptually, we need to reconcile this into an understanding that some nation states are perhaps further along or not. Now, as you can imagine, this issue is slightly more complex than I've laid out. For one, if you look to the left here, the notion that this is the Jaipur foot, which is a kind of prosthetic that is designed to be quite malleable and active, on the one hand is made out of really, really simple materials that you would think of as quite industrially um, low tech. On the other hand, the Jaipur foot in actual use is remarkably agile. It allows people to climb trees, sit cross-legged, walk around barefoot, and do things that something a little bit more um, technologically sophisticated might not. So of course this raises the question of what exactly might be more or less technologically interesting enough for us to look at in terms of institutional lag. Would it be that there are multiple ways in which prosthetics could be developed, some of which coexist? And so the social adjustment to these new products or processes might not exactly be so easily sorted into something that would be progressive or not. The other example I want to provide, which I'll get back to in a second, is the issue uh, particularly important now playing out in many countries about whether alternative health systems might have allowed us to address COVID-19. One of these that exists, for example, in the Indian system is what we know of as Ayurveda which is the an completely alternate epistemological system in which the science of health is seen and uh, grafted on systems of bureaucracy and particular technological advances. Now, it isn't just at the level of the Jaipur foot or the systems of knowledge associated with Ayurveda that this is an interesting issue. Economic theory struggles to describe how institutional variety might abound. <clears throat> For example, um, and, and I won't elaborate this here, 
But in growth theories, you see that there might be variety. You understand that there is variety. Economies are different, but you might be agnostic about exactly how much to sustain. Innovation theories, particularly the Schumpeterian theories, also struggle to describe whether variety is inherently good in the sense that it might be creativity generating, in which case, who could object? On the other hand, there isn't really a mechanism, a theoretical or methods mechanism to address how much or, or why or when. Development theories, more broadly speaking, in the political economy of development where I am trained, tends to broadly construed, think of variety as sort of the problem child. The more you have, the more miserable societies are. It's harder to decide uh, how much of something to deal with. But there is also a governance challenge, one of which, of course, um, in some of the previous um, papers, we've seen. These fundamental governance challenges, whether they be property rights, whether they be selecting winners, uh, all of these are, are policy issues that tend to really hit a wall. At the same time, in development theories, you have problems of classification. Depending on your theoretical lens, you might see a lot of variety as leading to labor informality. But if you come at it from a Schumpeterian lens, you are likely to see the own account or self-employed uh, worker more as an entrepreneur than you are as uh, somebody who's really falling off and requires a different kind of support. Now, evolutionary theories, broadly speaking, off the lot, if I had to kind of describe this, would say that variety, of course, exists, but selection mechanisms matter. And the dominant way in which selection mechanisms matter uh, in evolutionary theories could be, they could be several, but the one in which um, some of these debates become quite difficult has to do with policy design. So the theory of the firm in some of the list of these other approaches, the theory of the firm may be unproblematic. You might end up focusing in on say growth sectors. You might even agree that you want to pick winners. Let's just say that you have public opinion behind you. You still end up with a multiplicity of standards, property rights, or even particular kinds of R&D system, which I know our first speaker alluded to, in which certain privileges are given for particular institutional bundles and not others. So where does this leave us? In work, as you'll see from the slide that I presented at the Association for uh, Heterodox e Economics, for example, I have been engaged in a sort of a taxonomy development exercise where I try and use a methods approach to this problem by saying, Forget whether there is a normative question associated with what kinds of institutions or how many, but let's try and see whether there might be a sorting um, argument to be made about how we look at one class of technologies and similar types of industrial systems across time. And in this work, what we were doing was effectively trying to look at vaccines, which I know we're all completely and utterly sick of, so I won't, I won't belabor this point, but there is a way in which to look across vaccines across time and across particular uses of science and the handoff between public to private R&D. So the reason to approach it from the methods uh, standpoint is not only to flesh out a little bit about what we mean by lag and whether it serves as well with the complexity of uh, institutional systems we have today as countries industrialize, but also to see that in every domain there are particular problems in which lag may or may not be the right lens to look at. I won't belabor this, but if you look on the left side, you can see that there are certain fundamental metrics that can be used in order to ask whether there is a, a sort of a limited way of looking at data, which would allow us to understand phases, moving ahead, things that are better, uh, things that are more complex, and so on. Now, why is this important for us? 
the more you look at the sophistication of the industrial system, the more difficult it becomes um, to argue that there is such a directive thing as technological advance. Now, I don't want to get into all of the, the philosophical problems associated with this, but if you look across time, development obviously is not a linear march. And in most countries, there exists a multiplicity of co-evolving institutions and different knowledge sources and techniques. The classic case is what is described here today. One of the reasons for both economic paralysis uh, in terms of theory about how to frame zoonosis has very much also to do with the fact that there are multiple industrial systems involved in discussing how to change perhaps factory farming, perhaps looking at biodiversity. And then we realize, of course, that it isn't simply that you can um, deal with diet, but you also have to deal with not just wild animal trade, but you might have to deal with dairy cattle. So these industrial sectors, the more complex they get, there are fundamental clarifications perhaps that we might need to make about the epistemic difference in knowledge sources. And as I work in multidisciplinary teams, it's quite clear that the kind of work we're doing in economics is um, very useful, but certainly needs uh, to have much more of a crosstalk with other disciplines. So there has been, of course, a good recognition, uh, and this is really something I'm just going to sketch out and we, I can take the rest in questions that in evolutionary models, uh, the work of um, Wolfram Elsner, uh, the Safarzinskian von der Berg example mentioned here, these are ways in which formal models might do some of the work to reconcile certain kinds of both qualitative cases that might not neatly line up in terms of the tendency of technological advance, but you would also need, based on the specific microeconomics of the technology, need to address the number of products, the number of processes, the kind of switching, and the essentially combinatorial process as firms come in and exit the system in these different technology domains. So there has been quite a lot of work. And um, what I have here on the left-hand side is a fundamental problem, again, with classification that is, if we look at uh, the neonatal incubator that is shown here, you really do see that depending on where the problem is framed, which institutions generate the problem framing geographically, it may not be at all the place, the same place where the problem is solved. This leads to fundamental um, separation of countries in which the vast majority of solutions are acquired through technology transfer, and those which are fundamentally seeking to frame and solve a problem themselves. We see that obviously not just in COVID vaccines, but we also see this in diagnostic kits. And I just want to give you a very brief example of the kind of exercise we're doing here. So um, he, imagine that you have this qualitative heuristic to the right with all of its biases as heuristics have, it still allows us a type of initial sorting exercise that would allow us to understand how countries of very different kinds, which would traditionally have been just classified as low and middle income or, or richer countries, have actually adopted very different um, industrial processes in order to generate and manufacture COVID diagnostic kits. So what you see in the right-hand column is a way in which to sort the degree of levels of sophistication of their production regimen, which in many cases is actually very much at odds with the way in which we imagine these countries should have behaved. So there is a fundamental opportunity here to take the notion of lag, but to extend it with these sorts of heuristics. And if I had to conclude, I would say that lag has really a, a, a kind of, it is a product of its time uh, in where it was generated. And once institutional variety is taken very seriously, 
lag has a place, but it has a place almost as a sorting device within a heuristic. There are classes of countries, products, and technologies in which you might see quote unquote lag. The problem is that from an evolutionary perspective, given the combinatorial approaches you might need uh, in order to develop the taxonomy, you may have very little to say about whether these are in principle socially progressive or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Smita. Smita. Um, I want to say thank you again to all of our presenters uh, for what I think was a wonderful panel. And I especially want to commend everybody for staying in time. The goal was to have half an hour at the end for question and answer. And we have half an hour at the end for question and answer. So very well done. Um, now is the time, I think, where everybody would give a, a round of applause. So I'm going to assume that all of our attendees are doing that in their offices or at home. Um, I'm gonna go through the questions just as they came in. So that's starting in the chat with uh, Luke, a question for Novisa. Um, do you have a sense of how the shift in R&D expenditure from public to private impacted the industrial composition of that expenditure? And if that relates to the decline in total factor productivity growth in the neoliberal area. So Novica, I will yes. allow you to answer that. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Luke for this great question. Concerning uh, your question, how are the shifting RD expenditure from uh, public to private sector affect uh, industrial composition? There are several ways. First of all, we can see now that we have less fundamental and more applied research. Uh, then also we can see that uh, research are more profit driven than uh, social responsive when we compare with the previous time. And it is very important, uh, we can see that expansion of intellectual property rights results that corporate capital gain control over the earlier stage of innovation. Uh, all of uh, this uh, manifestation of shift in RD activities from uh, public to private sector has a strong impact on intensity and on, on innovation and uh, especially uh, diffusion of innovation. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, in very short uh, how this shift uh, affected uh, industrial composition and, of course, uh, a total factor, total factor productivity. Um, uh, do, you, do, you, do you need additional explanation or do you have a question, uh, Luke? No, that was great. Thank you. I was just you know, thinking, I mean, the, the other thing I thought of was that at least in the U.S., I know like in the you know, the Keynesian era, a lot of the public R&D was coming from military related R&D. So, I, and that's probably, an, I don't know, an important wrinkle to think about because not all, you know, military, e even if, you know, we prefer public in some way, not all military R&D is benign. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm not sure how that fits in, but that's that, that was also in the back of my head. Yes, yes, I agree with you, but uh, we have the change in the nature of innovation when comparing to Keynesian era and you know, neoliberal uh, neo era. I, I agree with you that we now have uh, less uh, expenditure uh, given the geostrategical <clears throat> uh, circumstances on, on military in the United States, and uh, that's uh, also the factor we uh, could consider in our analysis. I thank you for, uh, for your comments. Uh, maybe to switch to the second question. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, next question looks more of a comment from uh, Wolfram for uh, Novica. Uh, you focused on the relation of private to public. A different relation reflects a different institutional arrangement, obviously. Public reflects uh, institutions as enablers and coordinating devices with proper degrees of collectivity and complexity reduction in the complex economic system and innovation system in particular. In a word, we should view institutions perhaps more favorably under complexity than Veblen and Ayers did. Um, so that was directed for Novica, but uh, that I think the last idea, viewing institutions more favorably under complexity, maybe for the entire panel as well, because I think everybody touched on that a little bit um, in each of their papers. So I'll open that up to uh, anybody who would like to discuss it. Okay, um, um, I would like to first to, to thank Wolfram for uh, this great question. 
Um, concerning your question, uh, of course, I agree with you that institutions are the labels and coordinating devices in, in society. Uh, What's the main idea in uh, our paper we try to develop is uh, that uh, we can see that technological progress as a progressive changes in society uh, is not uh, accompanied by institutional progressive institutional changes. Uh, we can see that the RD performance of private sector in the United States we uh, analyze is not only based on their um, uh, their investment in IRD, we can see uh, government subsidies, uh, expansion of intellectual property rights, and acquisition of startups by uh, tech giants. Uh, under under uh, these circumstances, uh, we can uh, we can see that uh, institutions uh, the uh, more reflects. Uh, a vested interest of corporate capital uh, than the interest of uh, common man. Uh, for example, when we analyze uh, the substitutions of, of, of the government, what, what's the main purpose is uh, to transform taxes in uh, public goods. Uh, if we uh, have uh, the process of monopolization of innovations, we can see that the common man is uh, taxed uh, twice, first as taxpayers, and then uh, when this person uh, pay a higher uh, prices for the goods uh, that uh, uh, he uh, uh, that he uh, buy uh, in the in, in the condition of uh, in, in, in the condition of uh, monopoly. Uh, that, that's the that, that's the main main idea on uh, uh, that uh, institutional uh, that technological progress should be accompanied by uh, uh, adequate uh, institutional changes that are supportive uh, uh, to. Uh, to to to, uh, to the common common interest. Yeah, Smitha. Uh, just just to respond to this because I think there's a very important point that Wolfram has raised. I mean, you know, I'm really struck uh, by the example of Ayurveda, because if you assume, for example, as many countries do, that alternative health systems, for example, should be allowed within insurance there's an increasing question about what actually differentiates some types of um, adaptation, cultural adaptation to specific knowledge systems, including particular kinds of techniques and so on, and what is seen as an active hindrance. I wanna give you two examples. On the one hand, Ayurveda and Western medicine, if you like, what would be called allopathy in India, would be seen as very similar products uh, at, in the sense that you would also need to bottle, you might need to, in fact, even inject, you might need to create systems whereby the, um, the, the eventual product uh, requires a supply chain of a certain kind of quality, a cold chain, precision, and so on. On the other hand, the epistemic understanding of the science behind it is so different that you can see that there is a fundamental block between groups that want to divide these into two very different domains. One of which is much more focused on say symptoms. Um, and the other one is much more focused say on the techniques of um, quality safety standards. They both have quality safety standards, but they end up in very, very different epistemic professional communities. And what is quite interesting is that one requires far more of you, that is Ayurveda, far more of the individual in terms of lifestyle change than the other one does. So if one says your symptom itself is, is emblematic of something you must change, I can't simply give you either a pill or a product that will just deal with the symptom. So there are some interesting questions here of how we frame the cultural, what, what Ayres or Veblen would have specified as the cultural attributes of the adaptation versus what we would call the industrial system in itself, which today we take to mean the technical standards, the supply chain, the coal chains, and so on. So I do think there's something in what you're saying, which is that the complexity of the institutions have to be actually sorted much more carefully. And I'm not sure that necessarily the work of that period lends itself as easily to the current moment. 
Thank you very much. Um, anybody else want to comment on uh, Wolfram's point? Otherwise we'll continue. Okay. Um, from John Watkins for Jacob. Couldn't we say that stylized facts represent Veblen's characterization of mainstream economics as a taxonomic science? Taxonomic in the sense that the categories and theoretical constructs do not change. Yes. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, and again, it's that kind of, I, I didn't put that in just due to like constraints and stuff, but absolutely, right? There's something like taxonomic, taxonomic in the treatment of the stylized facts and in like, yeah, just this categorization without kind of adapting or moving to the stylized facts. Um, the key being, again, there's nothing like inherent in stylized facts that are problematic, right? Like heuristics are useful, looking for trends is useful. It's the habits of thought that are animating and how they're being treated and how they're being dealt with, which I think, John, that's what you're getting at. And I, yeah, I completely agree. Another question for you, Jacob, from Ramon Garcia Fernandez. Uh, the problem are the stylized facts, are the, is the problem the stylized facts per se or the use of wrong stylized facts? Don't institutionalists search for patterns? So the answer is neither. It's the problem isn't with stylized facts and the problem isn't, are they right or the wrong stylized facts? Those are always gonna be normative choices that are being made. And yes, institutions were always searching for pattern. That's why stylized facts can be useful because they help look at patterns. And again, I go back to kind of Lawson's 1989, I think kind of hit the nail on the head where he says, of course, we're always looking for patterns in realist analysis and evolutionary analysis. That's what we must do. But we're looking for patterns through and using abstractions to look at patterns in a way to understand the underlying processes that are generating those patterns based in cause and effect, based in cumulative causation. The problem with the style of facts the two that I highlighted as examples showing the potentiality for them to take on a non-evolutionary non-benign character is that both of those are eschewing or veiling the underlying institutional process. Essentially like getting themselves out of answering the question is what is the cause and effect that generated? What is the institutional processes? What is the process of cumulative causation that are generating it? So again, the answer to the question is stylized facts aren't a problem in and of themselves. That's why the paper I kind of said, and again, I'm being a little, I don't know, specific, but the non-benign, non-stylized or non-evolutionary character rather than nature, because there's nothing inherent in them that's wrong. And again, it's not that like the Phillips curve was right or wrong. For a certain period of time in a certain place, that empirical relationship held, whether you irrespective of your feelings on it, right? There was a normative choice to investigate that thing, but it broke down. I think the problem is, again, the habits of thought in terms of how we're using, utilizing these kind of things is how they're turning into this pre-constructed common sense. And then we start erecting models or building understandings and in doing so are actually veiling our ability to see what are the processes that are generating these phenomena. I mean, I think it's similar to like Smith's paper in the idea of like lag is like a pre-constructed notion that we've really adopted in institutional economics in, in a certain way, it's as she's highlighting it, like by focusing so much in lag, you're missing the heterogeneity of these other processes that are going on by just trying to fit it into this one box. And Smith, I might be wrong in characterizing what you're saying, but I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And I think that's similar again. So uh, that's a long answer. Reflexivity to attack the pre-constructed nature of stylized, fa like the pre-constructed nature of stylized facts, but there's nothing inherently wrong with them or are they right or wrong? We need to look at patterns but we need to be careful in how we do it. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from John Watkins for Luke. It is interesting that depending on the distribution of income and wealth, unanimity may be consistent with dictatorship. My question, did Buchanan address any of the compensation rules as a means of circumventing the Pareto criterion? So, yeah, so uh, thanks for that question, John. So yes, exactly right. In a highly unequal society, right, the unanimity criterion amounts to a dictatorial criterion because you can have, you know, 99, you know, 99 out of 100 people vote for some redistribution, but you have the one, you know, very rich, wealthy person vote no, so it doesn't pass the unanimity criterion. Um, in terms of compensation rules, I mean, yes, Buchanan did and does focus a lot on side payments and compensation as a way of uh, finding, you know, Pareto improvements or, uh, you know, unanimous 
uh, changes. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe there's something more specific. Was there something more specific? Maybe you can follow up about compensation or, or side payments that you were curious about. But Buchanan does, you know, write about that quite a bit. Um, it's all right. I'll give John a, some time to sure. respond Go ahead. in the chat. Um, there's a question from uh, Ramon Garcia Fernandez for Felipe and Valeria that I see Felipe answered um, in the chat. If it's all right, I, can we, uh, can I ask the question? You just kind of read through the answer just so if anybody missed that. Uh, Felipe, does that sound good? Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so from Ramon Garcia Fernandez for Felipe, can you speak something about the good side of social networks in case it exists? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for your question, Ramon. So we have uh, plenty of uh, good side of a social network because instrumentally it is a, a wonderful thing. Now it's, it's amazing. We can connect with people. We can uh, uh, get our contacts again. You now reconnect with people. Uh, our main criticism is about the ceremonialism around this instrumentalism. You know, our main criticism is social networks are reflecting institutions of our society. Th that's the problem. You know, the, the problem is not an instrumental problem. The problem is a ceremonial problem. So uh, I think that's it. I don't know if Valeria can add something. No, for me, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions, comments? I see, uh, yeah, sorry, Smita, go ahead. Uh, could I ask a question of, of Felipe and, and Valeria, which is, you know, as, as I'm thinking about our panel, so many of us have dealt with issues instinctively of, of ordering. So if institutionalists are looking for patterns, uh, presumably the assumption is, and if I understood your paper correctly, that there is a way in which the pervasiveness of networks and in a way the lack of ordering uh, means that people with whatever biases they may already inherently have tend to self-select. So on the one hand, you may have a system where the ordering is explicit. There's a type of fake news or other kind of way in which people are trying to reorder. Uh, but you also have a system in which people are coming into the system ordering. So could you elaborate on this a little bit? I can try. <laughs> uh, actually, yes, uh, social networks is very open you know, to people deal with. So you, you, we, we choose people who we are following in the social network, but uh, a lot of things is also introduced to us. Uh, a lot of fake news and a lot of, a lot of uh, business enterprise issues as uh, advertisements and things like that. So uh, somehow we are active in social network and somehow we are passive in social network receive things. So when I talk about coordination uh, or orientation, we have something that, okay, we are choosing what we are doing in social network, but we're still receiving a lot of information as in the pre-social network era. So, our point is social network changed things, but not changed a lot of things. And institutions is still the uh, they they are still the same. So, thank you, Valeria. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I I just I just think that. Um, the social network intensify the the proportion of institutions that you can reach with the use of our smartphones. So we are constantly um, in front of different things that we are used to deal with our now our 
um, nowadays, um, our quotidian um, life. So I think that's it, what we're trying to say on our paper. Yeah, thank you both. I was just really struck by, by, by the way you described something we all take for granted, but also that in a way from a public policy standpoint, I'm always struck by how little public policy seems to use the same networks that private firms, for example, know how to do quite well. And I mean policy in the, in the slightly more progressive sense that we think of policy design as opposed to government intervention. Thank you. Avi, can I, I add something? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, public policy and social network is something very strange because public policy is uh, really focused on protecting the big business, you know, protecting uh, Facebook and uh, similar uh, business enterprise, but not the user. That's a good point. Um, so I got an alert that we've got 10 minutes left for this session. Um, does anybody have any additional comments, additional questions, either uh, attendees or panelists? I'll just respond to uh, John uh, added another thing, the, the Q&A on the previous point. Um, so he said that compensation still reflects the power, existing power structure, especially since actual compensation is not required. And that relates to the point I made about Buchanan not addressing the issue of power. It, compensation, however, is a way to advocate government intervention. And so I, yeah, I would, yeah, John, I agree with everything you say there. I think that there's a tension between Buchanan's, uh, and it's not something that Samuels really focuses on, but in the, Buchanan's other writings, uh, the fact that he advocates for various compensation rules while at the same time kind of resisting most forms of government intervention. And I think that kind of tension or, or kind of perhaps inconsistency is bound up with the way that he doesn't really address issues of power. So I think your point's spot on there. Thank you very much. I missed that. So thank you for uh, reminding me, Luke. Um, if, I, if I could pose just kind of a general observation and then I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on it. It seems like what a lot of you are, what a lot of you are all talking about is the importance in understanding and recognizing and accounting for deep structures when trying to understand uh, the transformations in modern society. So the Novitz is talking about in, uh, innovation as a necessary but not sufficient condition for economic progress. The idea that you know there there's been a transformation kind of deeper underlying structures that have affected the way in which innovation affects the modern economy. When Jacob is talking about the stylized facts, uh, at least when I was listening to the paper and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like is the main issue with stylized facts and their use is that they're almost astructural or a-institutional. They don't take into account the underlying processes, as you mentioned, that lead to them. So just, I was hoping uh, just kind of maybe as a final comment in the last seven minutes we have it, uh, what the panel's thoughts are on just, uh, we're all institutionalists here, but just re re reiterating the importance of addressing and taking these deeper underlying structures when we're trying to form good progressive public policy, when we're trying to identify stylized facts, when we're trying to understand modern economies. So I'll mute myself there because I think I'm rambling and turn it back over to the panel. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Because I think one of the troubles, um, as I, particularly as an institutionalist, is we come also from very different traditions. And I remember as um, a PhD student, how difficult it was in a way to um, thread across many, many different institutionalists, all of whom were discussing, say, technological uh, advances, but were addressing the issue of institutions with very different language and assumptions about structure. And if there is one thing that I think I would like to convey, it's in a way that many of us as institutionalists don't take 
the specifics of the technology uh, seriously enough, because it, in a way, it's endogenous, right? I mean, the the institutional structure is is built in; it doesn't land in from Mars, and so the challenge then is to cherry pick um, the the particular details um, that help us flesh out what we have as I think very important building blocks of the original institutional economists. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I, th I, I completely agree. And I think there is like some tendency sometimes, I don't know, this could be my reading and I'm not trying to start any big debates or anything, but Ayers always presents to me as like, there's almost this dualistic institutions and technology, one's innovative, one's restrictive. And I think like Smita hits it on the head where it's like, you can't have one without the other. The technology is embedded in the institutions and the institutions are embedded in the technology. And I think, I don't know, that came to my mind a lot as I was listening to the presentations today and just kind of thinking about, I think we're all kind of attacking this in some way. There's, a, there's like this inner, there's this relational mechanism, like technology is not benign or non-benign, you know, institutions aren't benign or non-benign. It depends contextually related in how they're being used and animated. And I don't know, that, yeah, that kind of struck me today as I was listening to multiple panels. So Smith, I, yeah, I completely agree. And like dealing with that more explicitly, I think like there's space to talk about that more explicitly maybe than we have historically. If I can build off that, I think that's where uh, Foster's use of the dichotomy, the instrumental ceremonial is important because I don't think Foster, Foster to me, at least in my reading is very much technology, technological development has the capacity to be extremely beneficial or problematic. It itself does not choose how it's used. And that's where the importance of institutions come into play. Yeah, I think I think that's key too, and I think that's like one of the things like doing some of this stuff with Bordeaux. I really think Bordeaux was just an institutionalist in a different time, um, but like that idea of the pre-constructed, right? Like, there's nothing inherently benign or good or bad about like the pre-constructed. Pre, the pre-constructed is functional, right? Like, language is functional. It facilitates interaction. It facilitates certain things, but it can take on very non-benign characters. Um, over time and you can't categorize it right away. Like there's nothing in its nature that puts it in one place or the other. Thank you. Um, we've got about three minutes left. I'll open up the floor to the panelists for if they've got any final concluding thoughts or comments. a purely selfish request, which is to get everyone on the panel to stay in touch. I, I found it terrific and uh, really appreciate uh, Abraham's intervention. And I think you all forced me to kind of rethink bits of this paper. So thank you. I really hope we'll stay in touch. Yeah, I'm happy to echo that. It was such a pleasure to hear what people are working on and just get some feedback, but also see what other I don't know, it's just really fun after sitting in an office alone for a very long time. It's great to like hear what people are working on, read some stuff and yeah, throw some ideas around. So yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I would love to stay in touch with all of you. Okay. Oh, I keep getting alerts saying we're running low on time. Um, thank you all for a wonderful panel. Uh, I can hear everybody applauding in their own homes and whatnot. Um, yeah, hopefully next year we'll see a follow-on panel to this. Uh, it was really great. I think everybody's papers fit together extremely well. Thank you everybody for attending either bright and early or late at night, depending on where in the world you are. Um, and I hope to see you all at other panels. Let's thank again, thanks again to our wonderful presenters and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you thank all. You. So much. Thank, thank you, Avi. Take care. Thank you.